This is Women's Tech Radio, a show on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network, interviewing interesting women in technology, exploring their roles and how they are successful in technology careers. In today, Paige, I would like to talk about our early childhood memories of our parents playing video games, because I think I have a really good one. Do you have a really good one? I think so. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So my dad um, was actually a video game player. He introduced me to video games with my Atari 2600. Wow. Which was super retro now but really awesome at the time and he just loves racing like car racing and always has and so he used to spend hours when he could sneak away um playing pole position which is this terrible racing game but at the time it was so crazy because this little car would like go down the road you know this joystick trying to steer and he introduced me to like all the like he specifically bought like kind of kid-friendly games like we had this game called frogs and flies where literally the only thing you did was like hop back and forth on these two <laughs> lily pads and try to catch these squares that were flashing flies it was awesome <laughs> my sister and i spent hours playing that flies in air quotes <laughs> yeah they were squares yeah they were squares that would flash on and off to represent wow one. yeah wow okay well that's a little earlier than mine but uh, I do remember my dad had a lot of the the games that came on floppy disks, like the big ones. Oh, nice. And it was mainly like golf and sports games, sports themed. And, mm-hmm. and they were really horrible because it was early, early Windows, I think, or DOS. I don't even know. But uh, my mom played Metroid for hours. Really? Yeah, on, on regular Nintendo. And that that is one of my early memories. I played hours of Metroid. I was like so shocked when I found out years later and you got that hack code to have like Samus without the suit on, that it was a girl. I was like, what? No way. Metroid is a girl. This Plot is so twist. cool. Right? Yeah. Oh, Very cool. An awesome game. So uh, today we talked to Mai Iri, and she is a senior developer with Phase 2 Technologies. Um, she's an avid Drupal user and is also involved in organizing different Drupal camps and Drupal groups. Um, she kind of works as beyond a full stack developer. She goes all the way from project management to um, down to coding itself. And so we kind of have a, a pretty interesting talk about how she got there. But before we get into that, I want to thank Ting.com for sponsoring Women's Tech Radio. If you go to WTR.Ting.com, you can sign up for Ting. It is mobile that makes sense. They have a really good savings calculator that you can go to. You can just grab your current cell phone bill and you can go to their savings calculator and enter in your bill and see how much money you will save by switching. They have no contracts, no early termination fees. And with if, if you go to WTR.ting.com, you will save $25 on your first month's bill if you bring your own device, or you can save $25 off of buying a device from Ting. But that's not the only savings because you're going to save every month by switching to ting.com. And so we get started with our interview today by asking Maya to tell us a little bit about her position at Phase 2 Technologies. So I'm a senior developer. I work at Phase 2 Technology. It's, uh, it's a digital agency. Um, and we build some of the most trusted websites around the world, and we have a focus on content collaboration and experience specifically. So in my job, um, I do a lot of different things. Uh, I lead uh, new builds, I work on maintenance projects, I'm involved in some of the sales process in terms of estimating um, and uh, figuring out like approaches for proposals. I, I wear a lot of different hats, uh, whether it's analysts, dev, sometimes, definitely sometimes PM roles kind of thing. So that's what I do. Do you have a favorite role in that stack? Not really. I don't think so. Um, I, it, it just naturally happens, you know, when you're leading a project, you're going to have to think about like, okay some management roles, some kind of team management kind of things or project management specific kind of things. Or, you know, there'll be some kind of requirement that needs some sussing out and then you'll put on the analyst hat. And, you know, a lot of times that involves a lot of indulge, talking to the client. So, you know, you'll have to be more client facing and, you know, have that kind of relationship going too. So it doesn't really matter. It's all about what are the needs at that specific time. I like all of those different pieces, including right. obviously writing the code itself. <laughs> yeah. So you like the variety. Yeah. Variety is key. I yep. agree with that one. Yep. Me too. <laughs> totally. And is this like a 
you've always had this picture in your mind where you're like, I'm going to work for a consultant agency doing tech development and like as a little kid or like, how did you get started? Oh God, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? That sounds, <laughs> it does sound a little boring <laughs> as a kid to, to think that maybe to me, but. No, I wasn't one of those like 10 year olds, you know, programming. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> Originally, I wanted to um, go into medicine when I uh, entered undergrad. And then I, you know, I like I like science a lot, but I also decided I have like some background in art as well. So I decided in the end to go with um, graphic design route. And when I finished college, I you know, kind of combine both those interests by working on e-learning projects for medical students. And at that time, my role immediately after college was uh, creating kind of instructional animations and graphics and, and, and that, and that, and doing those kind of things. But then, you know, gradually I got more involved and started taking on like more kind of product management kind of role um, and got more involved in trying to figure out, okay, well, We've got these learning resources, and that's great. But how do we have it hosted? Like, how do we have a platform where this all this great stuff can live? And at that time, um, a lot of platforms were more about course management. Um, so there was Blackboard, which is closed source, and Moodle, which is open source. And working with Moodle got me interested in like, oh man, open source. Wow, this is a like modular platform. I can plug in, plug in all these different kind of modules and you know, have boom, functionality. But that was also limited as well, because as I said, you know, we were dealing with learning resources, not courses. So like a lot of people, I was like, oh, how about we build it. We build it ourselves. <laughs> and at that time, I didn't have any technical background, really. Um, so I work with the IT staff at the university. And, you know, there wasn't much, they didn't have as much time to, like, really go behind that project full force. So in thinking about that and having those kind of conversations, thinking about technical requirements, got me really interested in, you know, wanting to do less, less of, like, making something pretty in terms of like graphic design and the and and you know I'd kind of gotten away from that already by you know working on instructional animations but um more into like making something work like making a product or or you know focusing on the functionality kind of aspect and then I went into grad school to like kind of follow that interest and that grad school that I went to was very lucky. It was a lucky, lucky find. Um, it was at UPenn, and they have this master's program called Masters of Computer and Information Technology. And that was fantastic. It's specifically set up for people who don't have a technical background um, and who are interested in pursuing computer science. And you start out with, you know, learning the basics, like, intro to Java, or I think they've changed it now to like using Python. But anyway, an intro kind of computer science kind of course. And you're in like, um, eventually you can, based on like, you know, your interests and how you're doing in the program, start taking courses that like actual um, um, CIS, masters of CIS students are, are taking, like, you know, and I've, I've, I did some of that too. Like there were very interesting courses like, oh, well, how do we rebuild like, you know, the initial um, architecture for Google search, you know, and like looking at that paper and like making a distributed system and, you know, so that provided a lot of opportunity to like think about technology, learn about it, explore my interests, you know, whether it was hardware, which was kind of awesome or, you know you know, other kind of aspects of software development. And can you tell us a little bit about your work environment? It's a distributed team. So there are, at phase two, um, there's headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. And then we have some satellite offices. There's one in New York, San Francisco, and Portland. Um, and then there are a lot of people who uh, work remotely as well. Okay. Do you work at one of the offices or are you remote? I'm in New York, so I work at the New York office, but sometimes I work from home too. <laughs> I like I like the blend. 
personally. I, yeah. I work ent entirely remote and I do miss coming into y'all occasionally. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. There, you know, you get to chit chat a little bit, but it's good to have both. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular tool that was really monumental for you in getting into the technology? Like one that maybe like not through college, but like a resource online or a person or a book? Um, so, okay. So before I decided to go full in into that master's program, I did do a post back kind of, oh, let me take some courses and see if I like it. And the reason why I did that is because my senior year of college, uh, I, I tried, <laughs> I decided to take in my last semester intro to Java class, which was horrible. It was the worst class ever. It was so, it was a large class. I remember like, struggling and where, feeling where were lost. You for undergrad? Oh, I was at Yale University. Okay. And, you know, I was like lost on the concept of arrays. I was like, what is this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's why I decided to take a co couple of courses just to like kind of take a temperature check on like what, what I wanted to do here. So what was the difference between like the Java, the Java course you took in your senior year and like the courses you took in as a postdoc? Like what, what made the difference that actually said, yeah, I do want to go and pursue a master's and, and really learn this stuff? One of the main differences, and it really speaks to how great the master's program at UPenn was, it was set up for adults, people who have already completed undergrad. And it was definitely set up for people who had no, exp like the, un the, the, the undergrad class, definitely had a lot of students who were already kind of experienced. They had been dabbling around, doing all this kind of stuff on the side. And this was kind of like the pathway to, you know, a major in computer science. And, you know, there were a lot of guys. The teacher was kind of hard to understand. Not to say like, you know, yeah. I mean, I just think it was- It just the, wasn't an environment that matched what you wanted. Yeah. It wasn't a good learning environment for you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Did the language change? It was Java again. Yeah. The master's program was just, there was a, a lot of office hours, a lot of, hey, if you didn't understand this, come to this extra session. It was, it was just structured differently rather than like a typical kind of course where, you know, you just go to lecture, do homework and leave. There were a lot, there was lots of support. So it was much more intentional. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. How, um, just to throw that out there, like how many women were actually in that? Because I know the women's master's degrees for the engineering and computer science field is like usually below 20%. Like to, because this was a, a intentional transition program, did you have more? Do you have less? Did you notice? There were a lot of women and there were a lot of foreign students and foreign women, foreign like students, foreign students who were women. Um, so... Yeah, it was it was definitely different. They do a lot of um, good work in terms of recruiting and and promoting the program so that it it attracts more women. Like I remember that being one of the goals of like the the dean over there to make sure that we could have more women entering the field. Yeah. It does seem like places that are having intentional recruitment are are creating intentional communities have a lot of success in doing so. Like if they actually reach out and try, it is happening. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, outside of just like taking classes and such after after grad school, I mean, there are plenty of online resources like you'll drown in the number of <laughs> online resources there are. I know. That's actually anything. why I was asking, because like if there's one that you found priceless, I'd like to let the audience know, because that's one of the things that we really want to do is isolate some of the best resources right. for the audience. I think even more important than that is being involved in your local tech community. Um, that's what I found most valuable. I mean, I w when I left grad school, started working within the Drupal content management system, like there are tons and tons of resources out there. But what made a huge difference in my, you know, growth, my professional growth was joining, you know, meetups and meeting people and getting exposed and like being able to ask, you know, 
people you become friends with, like questions or jumping on IRC and like not being afraid because I've already met them before. And I think that helps a lot because, you know, it's very isolating in the beginning. You don't, you don't know. It's very intimidating. Like everyone knows what they're doing and like, you know, and just to like feel like you're in a community and like, yeah, actually like a lot of people are also beginning on this path and they have the same kind of question or, you know, you've experienced something that somebody else is asking like about and you can like kind of share that knowledge. Just having that builds confidence. And I think that's, that's key. Okay. So how did you go about finding your local technology groups? Did you use Meetup? Did you use uh, another type of social network? You mentioned IRC, but it's kind of hard to know. Like, how did you know to go to IRC? So first I went to Meetup. I'm also lucky in that Drupal has a lot of different local meetups that happen, like there are regional groups that you can join. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky to, you know, have that as well. And just going to meetups and meeting people after I made that first kind of like breaking the ice kind of thing, there are events that happen. Like, you know, sometimes there's conferences or, you know, many kind of conferences like camps. So going to those and participating, participating specifically in sprints really helped out a lot in, in getting more and more involved. And I, I don't know why. But I like to volunteer. <laughs> it's not healthy <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I think we all have this problem. Yes. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that I end up doing is, you know, we have kind of like a yearly camp for uh, in New York for Drupal. And I volunteered to help out with it and then got more and more involved and now I help organize it. Wow. So that <laughs> that's more than volunteering. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No kidding. So how would how would people find that? If if uh, some of our listeners are interested in, in hooking up with the New York Drupal camp, how would they find that? Oh well we have an upcoming conference in July and the URL to go to that would be nicecamp.org. But outside of that there's the monthly meetup that happens on the first Wednesday of every month. And to sign up for that, you'd need a Drupal.org username account. And you just need to join the NYC group on groups.drupal.org. So every month there's a meetup where people give presentations. And then afterwards there's, you know, a little get together. And then also um, on the last Wednesday of every month, people just there's something called Drupal Drinks, which happens <laughs> not only in New Hey-o. York, but, yeah, around around the world. So that's another way if you if you just want to like meet people and not have to like sit through a presentation, just to, like break some ice. That's that's another way to to get involved. Yeah, and uh, I I've been involved. I've done some Drupal development, and that community is very welcoming. Um, I've always found and. And they have meetups and groups in almost every city that mm-hmm. I that I've lived in. Um, major cities, yeah, some minor cities. Um, and they also have, I think now, don't they do some of them do uh, like Google meetups for those who can't make it out to major cities. I think they have some recurring like Google Hangout meetups and stuff. And most of that is on groups at Drupal dot org. Yeah, absolutely. And I saw that there is an upcoming like hackathon, an international girls hackathon coming up Saturday, like. February 14th and the 15th. And that's another way to get involved, like going and mentoring. Or if you just want to join in and learn something um, and and you want to understand like how to build, I think their, their goal is to like build a website and application. So that's another way to get involved. I think that's happening in various locations, but the one in New York is happening like on 21st Street, Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So I have a question because I think I've met a lot of people who are a little scared to go to their first meetup or scared to ask their first couple questions. Like as someone now who who was a newbie who came in and had to get involved in the community, but who is now like someone who might be considered a mentor or, you know, a high level leader. Like how do you how do you feel about like answering questions from someone who's never done Drupal or someone who's never, you know, done any scripting at all? 
I think that we all suffer from a little anxiety and asking questions, especially in technology, because like there's this whole kind of like ego tripping where, <laughs> you know, you're supposed, I thought you were supposed to know that already, but like it, the, the only dumb question is like not asking, like the, that's when it becomes a dumb question when you don't ask it. <laughs> and so there's no such thing. Like you have to ask questions. And for like I remember being scared or like nervous and you know you just get over that a little bit by just trying it out or finding like what happens is when you become part of a local community and you see the same person over and over again, you like ask them, "Hey, did you I don't know, I'm kind of like struggling with this like do you know what this is? And because you guys are already friends, like it naturally, like you have that relationship. That's why I say like join, you know, be more active, like outside of work in terms of like your local community. Cause like that will help you get over like hurdle in terms of answering a newbie, like uh, somebody else's question. Like, yeah, like, you know, there's always like that kind of fear, like, oh, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Like, <laughs> But, you know, you, you do know, like that's you just, you know, you already know, like you just need to be a little confident. One, one of the ways that like I figured out how to overcome that a bit is by like putting myself in positions where I'm going to be asked these kind of questions. <laughs> so I've kind of gotten over that a little bit. So we had a kind of global sprint weekend for Drupal and like okay well I was asked to if, if you know somebody was organizing in New York and the answer was no so I you know stepped up and you know organized that and that put me in a position of answering a multitude of questions <laughs> because like I was you know not only organizing it but of course I would be like a sprint mentor and you know you never know what kind of question you're going to be asked and you know, another thing is getting involved with teaching a bit. Like, so I recently trained, did like a two day kind of training uh, for a client and I had never done such an intense kind of in-person training. Like I was pretty nervous about it, but I had a lot of help in terms of figuring out the kind of activities and curriculum and all that such. And it went well. It was fine. Like you, like you know what you're talking about, and so you can answer these questions. But if you never put yourself into that like uncomfortable position, you'll you'll always fear it. And I think that's that's key. All right, Maya. So one last question before we wrap up. Um, I always like to ask, what's what's got you fired up in technology right now? Either something new that's coming with Drupal, or something that you're just kind of into. Yes. Yeah, so. Right now, um, I am actually taking a course, a, like evening course on uh, Angular JS, and um, it's been very interesting. I am excited about trying to figure out how to hook it up with some of the open data APIs that are provided by uh, NYC.gov, um, and that's what I'm kind of excited about right now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Women's Tech Radio. Remember, you can check out the show notes and RSS feeds at jupiterbroadcasting.com. And you can also find us on Twitter at HeyWTR or email us at WTR at jupiterbroadcasting.com. And don't forget to check us out on iTunes. And if you get a moment, leave a review. Mm-hmm.